That's not a lion. It's a giraffe. <laughs> Welcome to the Lovecraft Easy Podcast. Uh, this is March 11th, 2018. And uh, we're all excited today because we have a very special person on the show. Kelly Young has decided finally to return. You know, I don't know what we did to deserve this, but. Great know. to see everybody. I got to yeah. go. I'm blushing, love. Oh, and Laird Barron's here, too. So, hey, Laird. How's it going? Great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, why don't we all do our little quick intros, and uh, then let's have Philip start talking to Laird. Uh, let's start over on Joe's end and work our work our way over, and then we'll, we'll get to you last, Laird. Okay. Uh, Joe. Hi. I'm Joe Pulver, writer, editor. Kelly. Kelly Young, That's executive enough. editor, strange eons, right? <laughs> <laughs> Matt. I am Matt Carpenter. I'm from your government, and I'm here to help you. Uh, Pete. Hello, Pete. Well, let's go to Philip. Uh, I think Pete froze, looks like. Uh, hey, Philip uh, Fercasi, author and screenwriter. And uh, Rick? Rick Lay, writer of uh, French Introductions to Talbot Mundy. Oh, nice. Um, let's go back to Pete then, since he's come back. He's uh -oh. frozen again. Uh-oh. Oh, we may be Peteless, this, this podcast. And uh, Rich Bunting is one of my patrons. Uh, you want to say hi to everybody, Rich? Hey, uh, good evening. I'm... Uh... Ezine fanboy and Kelly Young fanboy and a patron. Oh, you had me too. Got to Kelly Young. <laughs> Thanks for being a patron. Appreciate it. He's uh, Rich is at the level where he can be a guest panelist uh, at times. I think Pete's still frozen. So uh, Laird, for I can't imagine that there's anybody listening or watching who doesn't know who you are, but let's pretend somebody like that is out there. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, Laird Barron here. Uh, I'm a writer uh, specializing in crime and horror. All right. Well, uh, you've just, you've got a new book coming out called Blood Standard. It's a, it's a crime thriller, crime thriller, excuse me. Uh, is that how you would characterize it? Uh, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty close. It fuses a couple uh, genres together, but essentially, it's a crime nor uh, thriller. I think the I think as the series goes on, uh, it'll sort of sort of evolve. Right. Well, Philip, you got some questions for for Laird, and uh, I think it's important to remember that if the podcast goes well, it's 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 me, it's all me, and if it goes badly. Then Philip screwed up somehow. So, so take it away, Philip. I have confidence in you. <laughs> I, I feel like it's that way all the time when I'm on. Uh, hey, Laird, how are you doing? That's true. Great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so, yeah, Mike was kind of got into it a little bit, but I think it would be really fun to talk about uh, Blood Standard. Just get right right into it. I know uh, it's coming out on May 29th from Putnam. And for those who uh, are going to be buying it or have pre-ordered already, because you can pre-order it now via Amazon.com, uh, what can you synopsize it? Can you give uh, a token synopsis of, of what the uh, the book's about and the, and the character of Coleridge? Sure. Uh, actually, here's what it. Uh, see if I can see this. Oh yeah, look at that. That's an arc, and I'm just going to go ahead and read off the <clears throat> basically the jacket copy. It's fairly short. Um, Isaiah Coleridge is a mob enforcer uh, in Alaska. He's tough, seen a lot, and dished out more. But when he forcibly ends the money-making scheme of a made man, he gets in the kind of trouble that can lead to a bullet behind the ear. <clears throat> Saved by the grace of his boss and exiled to upstate New York, Isaiah begins a new life, a quiet life without gunshots or explosions, except... A teenage girl disappears, and Isaiah isn't one to let that slip by. 
and delving into the underworld to track this missing girl will get him exactly the kind of notice he was warned to avoid. That turns brutally shocking and darkly funny, heartbreaking and cautiously hopeful. Blood Standard is both a high tension crime novel and the story of a man's second chance. The parts of his past that he will never escape and the parts that will shape his future. Sounds fabulous. And it's, I just said, I it's good to see you, Joe, work. by the way. <clears throat> Pardon me? It's good to see you, Joe. It's a long time. Oh, it's great to see you, brother. I, and I got to tell you, Isaiah I, uh, Coleridge, great name. Just love the name. As soon as I heard it, it's like, yeah, I want in. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it sounds great. Thank you. And, and I always hoped you would get pure and go where you're going. I just, I'm really thrilled. I hope this thing is a major home run. Uh, me too. Be nice. And I expect it. I expect with with your ability and and your love, um, it will be. Thank you. So, uh, is it Laird regarding Coleridge himself, Isaiah Coleridge? Can you talk off jacket a little bit about that character and? Or without giving anything away for the oh sure story. sure I know it's a character that you're planning on you know he's going to be around for a while through he's going to have some different adventures right right actually I just um, handed in the man well actually I'm handing in the second round of edits for the uh, follow up to this novel so uh, we'll be going into you know copy editing and that kind of stuff so book two working title is the Black Mountain. Uh, and, and so that's, it's basically done just, with, you know, copy editing and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, neither one of these books has come out, <clears throat> so we'll have to see, you know, what the sales are like and whether it justifies doing more, but I have, uh, a series, you know, planned, uh, for this character if it, if all goes well. Um, is, is he going to stick around upstate New York? That's sort of the home the home territory of the series. Uh, but he does, as the series progresses, he will travel. Uh, because the, 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 this shouldn't give anything away. This should just be kind of interesting for people, you know, uh, especially people who've read my work. It kind of opens up as it goes. The second novel, you know, the first novel is sort of an origin story. And uh, he, Coleridge, starts off as a, a contract killer for the mafia who, gets into some trouble uh, and instead of getting killed he he basically gets a reprieve as long as he doesn't you know set foot you know west of Mississippi essentially and uh, so he's in New York and he uh, kind of stumbles into a stumbles, stumbles into a case of a missing girl and uses his underworld connections uh, to sort of track her down or attempt to track her down and a lot, you know, a lot of that first, a lot of this first book is just him adjusting to his new life, trying to go straight, as it were. Uh, but you know, in sort of the classic sense, the more you struggle to get away, the more the the, the old tar pit of your old life tries to suck you back in. And there's a lot of um, loose threads in his past, shall we say, that uh, remain. And <clears throat> and on and on some of the bigger. Uh, Care, you know, some some of his enemies, like he's considered a loose thread. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on even at the start. But um, later books, the scope of the the scope of of his uh, his saga will will sort of dilate. It'll it'll become larger. Uh, we just have to wait and see how it goes. Yeah, I, no, I got. I would expect so. I mean, the 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 presence of noir and crime fiction in your work has been there forever. Um, uh, it's one of the things I adore about your work. Um, like I said, I've been long hoping you get pure. Um, so I, I'm just thrilled, thrilled. Well, I thank you. I, t I took my cue from the stuff I grew up enjoying and it, and it wasn't strictly crime or detective fiction, it's sort of a, spectrum of things that sort of in, in, that sort of are inflected upon this character and uh 
you know, obviously, I mean, there's the obvious stuff, the Parker, you know, uh, Spencer series and John D. McDonald's, Travis McGee, and you've got Marlowe and all these, you know, the Continental Op, they all sort of, um, sort of play a role in my thinking as I was developing this character. Uh, and of course, you know, I've written horror for many years, but crime and war, especially hard boiled stuff has always sort of been the beating heart of it. And then the horror uh, is injected quite often, you know, as a minor element that sort of magnifies. Oh yeah, well they're, they're, su they're such perfect bedfellows. Yeah, and, and so it was, a, it was a challenge though to write a traditional novel, a novel that uh, there are occult overtones as much of the great detective and crime and, and noir fiction uh, contains. There, there are little nods to intuition as being something more than, than you know, animal instinct. Maybe there's something more to it that coincidence isn't always coincidence. But I will say this for my fans and for anybody else who's maybe new to, new to my work. It is a it is a very straightforward crime novel in the sense that I don't um, I don't you know I don't try I don't try to cheat people who haven't read who aren't interested in horror by by tricking them into reading a horror novel or an occult novel. This is a this is a, a two fisted hard boiled uh, detective thriller you know noir sort of uh, combo. Uh, it's just I tell things the way that I tell them, and there's there's always uh, some aspect of dread uh, creeping up through the through the seams. And to answer Phil's question, you know, a little bit more about Coleridge. He's his father is uh, uh, an ex Air Force uh, colonel uh, was in uh, in the intelligence division of the Air Force, uh, and is now you know in his senior years a, a consultant for some for some combo of the alphabet soup that's out there of intelligence agencies, his son's not quite sure. They have a very fraught relationship. And his, and, uh, his mother is from New Zealand. He's, so he's half uh, Maori. And so he has, and he, and he definitely takes after his mother uh, as far as how he looks. And so, um, I don't know. I think he's, a, I think he's an interesting, he's an, he was an interesting challenge for me and continues to be as I develop him. Yeah, and uh, in regards to the series, and you kind of you already mentioned that there is going to be you've already written the the next book, um, and I don't know if you can talk at all about the next book, but in regards to other than just that it's written, but does uh, does you find the universe expanding at all moving forward, or does, is um, is it is it going to stay in your mind? Are you staying st straight crime down the middle, as it were, straight noir? Or is it going to delve into some other areas, or can you talk about it? I'm not sure uh, how much I can go into it, mm -hmm. um, so I'll just sort of be vague. Uh, the it's like it's I sort of approached the Coleridge um, series as if each book will be the last, because that's that's something that you're dealing with. I'm sure you you know being in Hollywood, you understand. You know, this is, you you ever know whether you're going to get a, a, se a season, or you might you might have ten seasons. You don't know. And, so each book is basically a season and they signed me on for two. So I write each one uh, with the idea that that's, if that's where it had ended. Then, you know, you would be satisfied. You might have some questions about where things might've gone, but um, you know, the, uh, you'll have a complete novel or a complete experience, but much as I do with it, Swift to chase uh, in my earlier collections, they all inhabit one or two universes and the, and they're all connected. The, the Coleridge novels, take place in the same universe as the Jessica Mace or the Children of Old Leech or any of that other, or Imago sequence, uh, any of that stuff. It's just that, you know, obviously most people don't encounter the supernatural or the numinous and Coleridge just happened to be, you know, one of those people has, doesn't run into that or hasn't run into that. Uh, down the road, I do see it expanding uh, because I lay the groundwork and the, uh, the groundwork in the first two novels for there to be bigger, and badder things going on uh, in the in the broader world, um, so you know I just had my I have my notes and I'm a, I'm a pantser I don't I don't outline too much but and so I be, partly because I I like to be surprised too but I do have a general idea at least for the next three or four novels sort of the shape of things to come if I get that far. Awesome. Well, it's, it's is, very exciting. Is there is there is there any change? To your writing style because you're 
switching gears to some degree and and of course you're you're hoping for a, a more mainstream audience yes that's a that's a that's a good question um it's it's kind of funny you know in some ways i thought i had really gone a long way you know maybe well i won't say too far but very far to make it accessible compared to a lot of my short fiction which i just it it, it looks like it looks uh, and i don't mind if somebody has to read a story four or five times to to decide whether they like it or not uh this had to be these these books have to be something that can appeal to a broader audience that's the whole point of doing these i didn't set out to write uh specifically lit crime or lit noir you know i still pay attention to detail i crafted it as you know i, I really went over both these books you know multiple drafts painstaking attention to language but where it differs from a lot of my short fiction um, is accessibility. Uh, short chapters. I, I was thinking about the croning. The croning is about ninety-three thousand words, and it, I think it has eight chapters of it, something like that. Uh, a paragraph a chapter, maybe two paragraphs a chapter. This is this is much more um, accessible. It's you know it's eighty eighty-two thousand words, something like that, and. Uh, the chapters are much shorter. You get a chapter every five to ten pages, and the idea is to keep it moving. That that there needs to be a, a certain sense of acceleration throughout the throughout the book. Um, and as far as language, you know, um, that's one thing. You know, I spoke with my ed editor about it, and it's it, what she is looking for uh, in my book books is consistency. So if you're if you if you spend a lot of time with kind of minute detail quotidian detail and really go into, you know, uh, beautifying that, then you need to do that all the way through the novel. There can't just be sections of it like that. And so you kind of have to pick a style. And the style I've picked is very fast moving and very, uh, the, the details are cut down, but I inject them at key points to kind of, to have a punch. So I think the long, you know, kind of, to kind of the nutshell answer is, People who are used to reading my stuff have experienced actually some of this in some of my later stories. Uh, I've been kind of sort of prepping my audience for this for a couple of years, at least with at least with some of the tone uh, of the, like, the Jessica May stuff. And really, the only difference between that kind of a tone and the Coleridge tone is just I there's less digression and there's and everything is just a little cleaner and a little you know a little uh, more to the point as opposed to sort of any baroque side you know side details um and then uh i don't know it's it, it was satisfying to write i'll say that i was uh, gonna oh, go ahead. Go ahead, protagonist is in the same universe as the just gonna be one of my questions and i find that really interesting um uh there's a john Connolly. i don't know if you've read the charlie parker series I, I've, but it I've, I've never read it, but it's great. I've read some parts of it. It's great. Yeah. It, yeah. He's a really good writer. That's a really great, yes. he's a really great, great detective. Um, but the series starts where there, there is no supernatural. And then he, he right. very, very, very slowly as the series progresses, starts to get into it a little bit. Yeah. And I was wondering if you were considering something similar. No. Um, although I've already, you know, I'll talk about the second novel in, in kind of broad strokes. Mm -hmm. I was really, you know, the first novel, you, it took me a year, year and a half to write it. It took a while to sell it. And during the, the submission process, it was a very, my, I have a really great agent, Janet Reed, and it was a very meticulous, painstaking process. She would only send it out to just a small group of people at a time, and then they had all the time they needed. To look at it in some cases people had it for months you know months and months trying to decide what they were going to do with it and during that time of course i had an opportunity i would you know the book had gone cold in my sh on the shelf there and i would take it take it off the hard drive or look, you know, open up the hard drive and go, oh i think i didn't really rewrite it but i was able to really polish it you don't have that i didn't have that luxury for the second novel uh you know sold sold the first one like all right next year we want another one you know and so I had very little time to do it relative to the first one. It was plenty of time, but it was just compacted. And 
I was very nervous because when you're, you know, when you have a deadline like this, if, if the editor doesn't like what you give them, you'll get an opportunity to rewrite it. I say opportunity in air quotes, you will be told to rewrite it, but it's, it, it, that could be kind of a fraught process. And I just, I was really worried. I was happy with the writing, but there's a, a much, I won't say darker because the first book has extraordinarily dark, Dark enough scenes. My editor said she was read, you know, or excuse me, my agent read it between, you know, between her fingers in a couple places. There's some pretty, there, there are a few scenes of just, you know, intense or uh, uh, very intense brutality, shall we say. But the second one skews more into horror in the sense that there's a serial killer at large, uh, ex mob enforcer who uh, of, of some renown who has kind of sort of in moonlight moonlights as a, as a, as a serial killer as well. And that automatically takes you into, depending on how you do it, that takes you into dark, very dark territory. And I also, I, I really enjoyed like in the Imago sequence and some of my, some of my earlier cosmic horror, some of the, um, I don't know, some, some of the, the philosophy, you know, how we look at cosmic horror, how we look at the cosmos. And I was able to actually inject some of that philosophy uh, via an old mentor of the protagonist of, of uh, Coleridge's, uh, one of his old mentors, who is sort of, uh, you know, tapped into that. And I was able to bring some of that into the second novel. So while the novel is no, no, by no means remotely a cosmic horror novel, it talks about it. it it's in there. Uh, you know, someone's espousing, you know, this worldview or this universe view. And he had something to do with shaping uh, Coleridge's philosophy. And I was really pleased she had no problem. My editor had no problem with that. You know, because part of her job is 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 is, is continuity in the series. From what I understand, it's fine to evolve a character, evolve the series, but it has to be done progressively. And it has to be done in a way that you don't lose all the audience you've built up so far. Uh, and so I was, I, I, heaved a sigh of relief when she accepted it and was actually quite pleased with it and so I, so basically the second novel uh it's not a horror novel but then neither is silence of the lambs and it's closer to that kind of thing or true de true detective season one than the first one is the first the first one is is uh you know you're hunting for a missing girl and there's a lot of uh gang factions warring against each other there's a mercenary company that he runs across second one has some of that but we're now we're talking about serial killers and uh some mysterious you know the department of defense and some of the black ops projects that they may or may not be involved in and i had a like i said it was a different experience but it was it was just as much fun as, uh, as the first one i can't wait to read it it sounds really interesting i know so I'm already excited to read the second one, and I haven't even read the first one yet. <laughs> it's frustrating. Um, uh, and Larry, I was going to tap you, you. You kind of already tapped on this, and Joe mentioned it as well. But I think it's, and I don't know if the misconception is the right word, but I know that um, there's, you know, that idea of this being obviously this is a crime novel, being, um, you know, and and everything you had written or published today had been horror, and it's kind of seeming kind of like a bit of a seismic shift. But the reality is. And I would love to hear you, your thoughts on this. Is that one? You've injected a lot of noir crime into much of your body of work to date. And secondly, um, you wrote this quite a while ago, so it's not like it's uh, it's not like you you know a year ago decided that you were going to start writing crime. No, that's that's very true. I have a tendency to sort of accept, or at least not resist labels, uh, unless unless there's something factually incorrect and also damaging in some way um i've been very I, i've tried to be honorable honorable about my relationship and 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 kind of debt to the horror community whether that's the editors the fans the various um the, the various publishers because without that community and without the science fiction community you know, i started out at fantasy and science fiction which is primarily that's science fiction and fantasy, it's much more traditionally oriented, even though they do publish some crazy stuff, um, like some of mine. Uh, I, but I feel like I, but they were willing to, you know, Gordon Van Gelder said, no, we, would, we, we do publish horror as well. We need, to, we need to represent that occasionally. And so I, I've always felt that I, on top of just, you know, being proud of what I do in general, um, 
I've always felt that I that I that I basically I owe a debt. And so, even though a lot of my stuff, if it's say it's a hundred pages, ninety five pages is probably straight crime or ninety, you know, and you've got ten pages in there that's that's horror. I've never resisted though the idea that that my intent, you know, was horror that I'm a horror writer first. Uh, but but that's simply because I don't. It's not something I've ever felt the need to fight about um, or to or to resist. But mathematically, you know, uh, it's true. I, you know, I've been writing, you know, crime has been sort of the bedrock or noir has been the bedrock of my, a lot of my stories over the years. And I wrote, I wrote this story and uh, this novel in 2014, uh, or actually I wrote it in 2013 and then it didn't really get out on the market until 2014. So yeah, you're talking, you know, right now it's, it's four years. I wrote it four years ago, essentially. And, um, and I wrote the next, you know, the follow up just last year. And in between, I've been writing all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's been in my head to do this for a while. I have a lot of aborted uh, or incomplete crime novels sitting on my hard drive, you know, uh, from years ago. Uh, that was actually before I became a published writer, that was in my mind is to try to do something along the lines of a Parker novel, you know, or a Spencer novel. Um, you know, or or a Mario a Mario Puzo thing, or a or a Stephen uh, Martin Cruz Smith thriller. You know, I, like I said at the top of this, I I think it's impossible. I don't know if it's impossible, but it's it doesn't really interest me necessarily to write a a strict crime novel or a strict thriller. I like, and maybe I'm addicted to the process of mixing these. You know, maybe it's ninety nine percent or ninety percent, ninety five percent one thing. But I always am uh, tempted to bring something else in, uh, whether that's you know horror, whether that's cosmic horror, whether that's you know add a mystery element uh, because these are discrete genres. You know, I kind of just toss them toss them around willy nilly, but they are discrete genres. I just I just like to to round them together and see what kind of fusions created. Yeah, I think mixed genre stuff is 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 really fascinating and i think even in film and tv i think that's what i you know and um you know i think that's i think it i don't know i think it adds a it opens the universe of the story so much that you can you're not you don't feel as constricted to one to one form or another form and i think when you kind of mix a couple of genres it it opens what can happen it opens the possibilities of story and i've explained that to people as you know when i'm talking about you know my work i'll talk about i love that it's horror and supernatural because it just opens up what what you can do um to such a huge degree and i don't know if this came up with you and i talking about it or if i heard it on one of your other interviews over the years but i meant i remember you talking about um dan simmons uh and his career and how it's an interesting career and, and it kind of reminds you remind me a little bit of him because of you have so many different interests and you know I know you have uh, fantasy dark fantasy stories that you want to tell and 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 crime and noir and horror and you think and again I don't know if you and I talked about this or I heard it but I remember you saying something about the effect of the, the Dan Simmons books tend not to be so much genre books they tend to be Dan Simmons books right and, and I think that's a really interesting way to describe your books as well I mean I would always describe uh, I mean, it just horror is the obvious um, genre label on a lot of the work to date, but also I think a lot of people tend to describe your work as well. It's a, it's a Laird Barron novel or it's a Laird Barron collection or a Laird Barron story. And I think that kind of says a lot more than any genre can. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that. You know, uh, I see that a little more as time goes on. And, and obviously Dan Simmons works in genres too. So, you know, that, there's that, that's a point that has to be made, but um, or at least he gets categorized, you know, when he writes his various books, like the terror is historical, you know, it's a historical novel, but the point is, is that he's allowed to do that. He's allowed to write a couple of historicals, then turn around and do what the Hyperion, you know, the whole, this, this Baroque science fiction, uh, series, and then come back and do, you know, uh, you know, uh, like summer, you know, or I shouldn't say come back, but then, you know, he's also has done summer of night, you know, his, child in danger horror you know kind of classic sort of a classic uh, setting and i would like to be able to do that um i realize that it's going to be rough because i've already received it's minor but I, i'm already receiving flack 
what, why are you doing this? You know, there's, there is some resistance to somebody was saying the other day, you know, they were really, they were actually heartrendingly upset, you know, that they felt I was abandoning them uh, and their interests because we already have enough, they said something to the effect of there are enough crime novels, noir novels to, if you stacked them, you know, on top of each other, they'd reach Venus. Well, why do we need more? And and so I'm already kind of running into some of that. Um, I've had reviewers, you know, talk about uh, speculating, you know, and, and and kind of kind of raising an eyebrow with the fact that I'm jumping genres. But you know, I I, I think that's could be a whole show talking about genre and whether you know what the differences really are and how they and how they cross pollinate how they overlap where are the borders i mean that it, it could be a very long conversation and it, it, frankly it doesn't really interest me that much except that i need to know enough about the different i, I can i think of them as traditions more than i do genres and i look at the different traditions and i need to know i don't need to be, need to be an expert but i need to know enough about the the, the ones that i'm that i'm working in so that i can be faithful and I know where I'm crossing the lines and, and, and where I'm changing things or deviating so that I, I feel like uh, that's, that, that's re the respectful way to be. But, um, you know, and going back to a question one of you guys asked a few minutes ago, uh, just to more fully answer it, or in case I didn't, uh, the whole idea of whether this, the Charlie Parker, the deal, whether, the, whether Coleridge will eventually become a supernatural series because obviously I love supernatural horror. And I want to say no, because um, that's not my intention. But I will say this, the minute you say no, the minute you say never, then fate has a, a funny way of kicking you in the ass. <laughs> yeah, right. well, you know, you're, you're reading, I mean, it's obvious in interviews, in your work especially, um, how wide ranging your readings been over the decades. Um, uh, it, it's also obvious in your work itself. Um, a lot of the places you've read extensively, how much it affected you. Um, I, I guess I can understand how some people would go, a oh, Laird's leaving us um, and feel bad about that because they've fallen in love with what you do um, and with your voice, but I think there's a lot of us out there who've been waiting for you to move to the left and then jump over to the right and tinker there a bit more. Um, you know, we could see your love for it um, and with, with the amount of, of talent you have, it's like, it's going to be interesting how he plays in this. I hate to call it a sandbox because I don't know that you're really changing sandboxes as much as I'm just shifting the weight here on the scale this time around. Um, hopefully once they read it, they'll, th their concerns will be alleviated and they'll just shut up and move on. Um, <laughs> well, I, 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 I think it's a great thing, you know. I don't begrudge. I don't listen. I'm bringing this up just as a as a matter of fact, a matter of record. Not, I don't really have a negative opinion about it because nobody's been rude about it. I'm just expressing that it's out there, and it's something to be aware of. You know, there was a, a bit of resistance to Swift to Chase because even though it's horror, that's a collection that it's kind of difficult. Some of the stories are, are not straightforward by any means. And also the horror is different. Uh, the cosmic horror took a, a, a very much of a backseat except for a couple of the stories. And, you know, some of those stories are psychological horror. Some of them are straight up slasher. I shouldn't say straight up because I always do something to it. But, you know, I wanted to explore that that type of horror because I, have, I really haven't in the past. And yeah, oh, there were people that really were, were very unhappy about that. But that's their right. It's their right to be unhappy. Uh, as long as everybody's civil, I don't have any, you know, I don't have any problem with it. It's it's just something that I that I note. It's it's a bit of a headwind, and I don't know how much of a headwind it'll be, because you know I waited a long time. Uh, my career is my career has really, in places it progressed rapidly, but overall it's been a very you know I've been around for eighteen years now, and. I'm still a new writer, a new you know a new voice to some people, especially I'm assuming in the crime world. But uh, 
it, this has been a this has been a slow, steady evolution uh, of my interests and my and my technical abilities. Uh, so, you know, I, to me, it doesn't seem like a big jump, but it it is for some people. And my goal is just not you know I don't want to leave everybody behind. But I think one thing everybody needs to you know might be of interest to my fans is uh, I have to write. I have to at least take a crack at the at the at the big publishing, uh, you know, New York publishing. I was going to say the big leagues, but it's not really the big leagues. It's more just that that's where the where a lot of money is and a lot of readers are. Uh, if I were to be able to sell a novel a year, a novel every couple of, uh, of years to Put GP Putnam Sons uh, in this series or in, a, or in another series, all that does is open up more opportunity for me to continue with my short fiction and with my and with my more baroque or esoteric horror i don't plan on leaving that behind i mean obviously if i'm spending more time writing commercial fiction i'm going to have to balance it but i've struggled for many years to make a living you know i i have sustained myself solely on short fiction and uh the occasional movie deal and the croning and stuff like that over the years and it's very difficult um you know, it's. I feel, I'm honored to do it. I don't want to complain, but it is very difficult to make ends meet uh, writing short fiction collections, uh, and it's not sustainable ultimately. As what you know, uh, for me financially, but if I, you know, if I can sell, if I can sell a few of these uh, commercial novels, it is a good thing for my for my fans who don't want to read the crime fiction. Um, you know, the more the more domestic tranquility and and uh, prosperity that I have, the the more that I can uh, become savage and write more, uh, you know, more stuff that doesn't sell, quote unquote. Uh, can, I, I just want to make a comment. Um, talking about George R. R. Martin, he's written these hugely successful Game of Thrones books, and he's got this rabid fan base that doesn't want him to do anything else. But he's a man, you know, he has his own interests. Uh, he does another series like um, his wild card series he really right. enjoys. He owns a movie theater that he likes to bring people and talk to. He loves the NFL. It's like, well, he respects his fan base. He has to do what he loves and pursue his own interests. And he doesn't live his life for the fans. You know what I mean? He's grateful, but ultimately he has to pursue his own muse. And, and commenting on that, you know, there's like, so Ian Fleming, Ian Fleming writes James Bond books, right? But, yes. you know, he's also the author of one of the greatest kids' stories ever written. Right. Chitty, chitty, yep. chitty, chitty, bang, bang. Yep. So, and then Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl, I was going to, it was on the tip of my tongue. It's, you, it's the flip side. He split writes. Person, that's a split personality with Roald Dahl. I, yeah. I, growing up, did, I had no idea that he had written adult fiction, right? So in my really teens, adult fiction, <laughs> uh, hardcore, and yeah. it only it, it it's the same guy, but it's a different but it's a different guy. It's like all right, the kids are in bed now. Let me tell you a story. No, right. and that's absolutely that's absolutely. I roll doll as one of my role models, not necessarily as a human being, but as a <laughs> but as a writer. <laughs> roll doll is pretty hard to, you know, he's one of those problematic guys. You know, he's dead, so it makes it easier. But the bottom line is, he was a genius. As a storyteller, of whether he was writing for children, young adults, or uh, old reprobates. Yeah, I don't think people, a lot of people are, realize that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is also the same guy who wrote Switch Bitch. That's, right. you know, that's the, I was trying to get that in there, and you, you, you beat me to it. <laughs> over, over to You is my, I think, is my favorite of his. That's, that's his collection about his. Um, that basically, you know, it touches on his time uh, in the RAF, and it has some of the most. In fact, I believe it's the title story. Over to you, you will sob if you have if you have a soul. You will sob reading that. Uh, where it's a couple bombers talk. They're in a bar, a cantina, and they're talking about their experiences bombing people. And he goes, "Have you ever bombed one side of the street instead of the other, just because you just all these life and death decisions that they made." You know, over the years, it, it's it's truly affecting. I mean, the guy could be humorous, but he could also just gut you, and uh, I really respect that. I think it's important to remember too that you have fans who 
Well, even on the even on the uh, live chat right now, Kevin Wilson says, "quote It's really quite simple. If Laren Barron writes it, I want to read it." You know, and several people are basically seconding that emotion. So I, I do think you have a lot of those types of fans. I, I think I do too, and 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 that's also why I, I like to stress, even when they get, even when they're pissed at me about fear, you know, fearful. Like I said, there's a guy on. I I just it came up in my. It came up in my inbox. The guy, uh, he recorded like a 12 minute sort of, you know, vent venting about what was going to happen with my writing. And, you know, really? wow. oh, yeah. And it was really upset. What wow. happened to the guy who wrote the three, first three books? What, what, what is all this in war? It's infecting his horror. And, you know, and here's the thing I, I don't have a problem with that. I actually am sort of touched by it because the guy cares. He's, he's from what I can tell, he's, he, he purchased everything I've ever written. And, and so I do agree with George R. R. The idea about George R. R. Martin is that you can't you can't live your life for other people. But I will say this, especially especially where I am, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to have this existence that I have, where I get up every day and I sit down at the keyboard and I write without these dedicated fans. Uh, and so I really really appreciate them. And I just you know I, I want to do I need to do what I need to do to survive. I need to do what I need to do to be sustained as an artist because, you know, if it was just about money, I would go be a plumber or I'd go back commercial fishing or do something. You know, there's a lot of other things I could do that are more lucrative than writing has proven so far. But, you know, I like to get up and do this. And so um, I thank the people that make it possible. And that begins with, with guys like Kevin Wilson who, who buy my stuff and, and support me. And some of them support me with a smile and some of them are like, well, you better not, you know, you better not be writing crime for everybody. I'll buy some of your books, but you better get back to horror. And I, I assure them, I've got a lot of editors that are waiting, you know, for me to turn in uh, some short fiction this year. And it's it's all horror. Yeah, I was going to say, I happen to know there's at least one. So, uh, And some of, it, some of it will be cosmic horror. So yeah. there you go. Uh, Rich, you had a question you wanted to ask, didn't you? Yeah, I just, um, hey, you Rich. know, I... Hi there, Larry. Thank, thanks for uh, you know coming on here. I, I you know I have this uh, this book that I had bought on the philosophy of horror, and it, it attempted to be very academic about it, a philosophic journal about about horror. And they interviewed a lot of the heavy hitters in the horror genre, asking you know the million dollar question, "What is horror?" So a lot of the responses that I saw were things like, "Horror is life lived; it's everything," or don't they got very upset if you try to exclude anything from the horror genre so they would I, there were things like don't tell me that Mad Men is not horror televised or don't tell me that Jillian a Jillian Flynn novel is not horror and I, and I was a bit confused because in my mind if everything's horror nothing is horror that was so, you took it out of my mouth yeah uh, so that being said the, the um, I'll ask you, what do you think is horror that defines it from, say, other genres like thriller? So thriller and, say, mob movies like Goodfellas or, or The Godfather, there's a lot of extreme violence or even, you know, ha a Hannibal Lecter film. There's a lot of extreme violence that, you know, at least to me, um, th they're more extreme thriller, not perhaps horror, because those things, you know, in, in literary naturalism or film naturalism, it's very, it's mundane. I guess that's the best word I can I can choose and horror for me takes us beyond the mundane uh, and and for in my view a horror there's this necessity that you have to have at least an aspect of the supernatural perhaps preternatural and anything else is just you know it, it it's 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 simply the evil of man which I get we all know that man is evil it's it's going a little bit beyond that to me that brings you into the horror so as somebody who writes in both crime fiction which i love and i can't wait to read by the way you know this book that, that that's coming up but how would you explain that to somebody new who says uh, you know what's the difference between putting a a pickaxe in the back of a man's neck to execute him because he didn't pay you enough money for his protection and you know say a werewolf you know attacking somebody or a 500 pound bo 500 pound bomb dropped in wartime uh versus say you know a vampire attacking violence is violence death is death you both end up dead how do you how do you kind of differentiate that well i i, I think a lot of it is and I, I have a pretty 
you know, eclectic idea of what horror can be. Part, part of it is I, I kind of roll with things, but, but, and so I think some things actually are, um, like I think something that's not pure horror, because I, th I do think there are pure examples of, of all these genres. I mean, you have romantic comedies. Well, it's a romance and it's a comedy, but there are comedy comedies and romance romances. And I think horror might, you know, and I haven't really, this is actually, this is a new, you put it in kind of a new way for me. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking on my feet here. Um, but I think horror might be subject to that idea as well, because all these, all these genres are uh, primarily marketing categories uh, or, or in some cases, academic categories. But I, but I think if we just kind of go with that, the Socratic idea that, okay, we got our definitions, then to me, it would just be logical that some things are pure horror. And I think when you talk about supernatural, the supernatural would probably be the calling something too horror would probably necessitate it being at least somewhat supernatural. However, you have something like, and I, I talked about this earlier, say Silence of the Lambs, uh, there's arguments amongst very reasonable and intelligent people about whether that's a horror movie or whether that's a, a book or whether that's, you know, no, that's just a thriller, it's crime. And I, I've actually made the, I've come down on the side in the past that it could be, uh, you, you could look at it in either way. So I, I think it's, I hope it's not a cop out, but I actually think some literature can shade in either direction. Like an example would be Cormac McCarthy. I've considered that potentially a horror novel. Other people say, oh no, it's a historical, purely historical. Other people are like, it's, it's a historical adventure or, or even um, a literary pulp kind of a thing. Uh, but what would differentiate for me, if you just got rid of the shades of gray, what's the difference between a pure horror uh, piece of literature or movie and versus one that might be horror inflected would be intentionality would be number one you can't you can never discard the intentionality of the creator secondly uh whether whether it either is supernatural that whether that would be a component there's also the possibility that i think transgression there are some uh, there are some there are some taboos or some some types of transgression that are either rare or so rarefied that they might qualify as almost supernatural in the sense of how someone interacts with them. It's so beyond the experience of someone that they become overwhelmed with, with the, with the experience. And I think the problem with that though, is that it's a, it's a moving target. So what we might've considered a horror novel or might, what might've been transgressive or frightening in the Victorian era, like, Oh my God, an angle it's exposed is, you know, now it's like nudity on TV and we don't care. So, it's it's very difficult because it's a moving target. But for me, pure horror definitely has to contain some kind of experience or element that is not something. It, it, first of all, it has to be awful. It has to be horrible. Uh, it has to be disgusting or terrifying in some way that it, very visceral and very very uh, primal that you don't you can't expect to experience in everyday life. I think that would at least be some sort of bedrock to, to differentiate differentiating that between somebody simply beating somebody up and like you you use the example of the mafia well we don't run into mafia violence all the time the average person doesn't but we know an awful lot about it or we think we do because it's ritualized it's 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 a tradition that we're like oh well if you cross the mafia they're going to give you a sicilian necktie and it's horrible they, they do all these horrible things they're going to bury you in cement or whatever and this is all awful stuff and uh the, you know, or we're gonna they're gonna have hitmen go around and wipe out a whole family. Well, the thing the thing about that is is that it's 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 ritualized. We're desensitized to it. It really can't be it really can't be horrible uh, anymore. And I actually think that's sort of a a trap that a lot of contemporary horror has fallen into. Who's scared of werewolves these days? Really? Uh, who you know? A lot of times, vampires aren't. That's why you're hearing people say vampires are scary again. Because a lot of times, uh, vampires, werewolves, other creatures that go bump in the night, Cthulhu, uh, is becoming so ritualized and so sort of, you know, cataloged that it's no longer hor horrific or horrifying. And maybe it becomes something else. Well, do you think then that the, the ambiguity we're talking about, like with McCarthy, you, like the judge in Blood Meridian? Yes. You know, I, I, I don't know if that's supernatural or if it's just a period piece, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, I've had some great debates and discussions with people about 
what the judge is, you know, and what he represents or what it represents. And uh, I think that for me, the uh, the judge and some of the shocking, the shocking violence, but also the sur the surreality and the kind of how how some, sometimes the narrative is divorced from what even hardened people of war might have ever experienced kind of projects it into almost a supernatural or, or, or occult realm that for me justifies it at least being in the conversation as being a horror a horror novel but although I, I like i said i think that it i think it's quite possible that these things are more than one thing i think maybe the maybe the the biggest mistake we make is saying no something is science fiction or it's fantasy or whatever what if it's like people that made it what if it's more than one thing Pete, you have a question? Well, it, sometimes it, it's there, there's a perspective as well, and this might be a, a wholly personal perspective. If you go back and we look at, say, the Dunwich Horror and the Shadow of Rinsmith, they're horror novels or horror, horror stories. But in retrospect, are they really like the first transhuman stories? Right. You know, now that we kind of understand, we have a new perspective on some science fiction concepts that we didn't have a hundred years ago would we re would we evaluate those stories differently well I, I think yes by necessity uh, academics you know I'm talking about fans now you know uh, academics you know uh, yeah they might do this all to, the time well, well and also they're able to and, and they're very rigorous there's a rigorous process and taxonomy and all this stuff but just talking as you know educated laymen or educated fans yeah, I don't. I, I I acknowledge that Lovecraft stuff is 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 technically horror, but but a lot of it doesn't horrify me at all uh, compared to modern writing. That's why it goes back to the moving target. Almost no ghost story terrifies me uh, at this point. The way that they were written, they, I know what they were intended to be, but they're not frightening to me anymore. But there are exceptions. You know, M. R. James uh, has a couple stories that still ch chill me. Uh, the and the yellow wallpaper is still, you know, is t some things do do remain terrifying. I think in, I think insanity or loss of or, or d the disintegration of sanity uh, uh, and the other, you know, or othering remains uh, a really dreadful prospect for a lot of us. But but the but the target keeps moving, and that and that is it makes it difficult to pin it down. And Philip. Yeah, I just wanted to say I think it's a good segue talking about sort of trying to classify things. Um, and I wanted to talk touch briefly on uh, on uh, the film that came out over this past week, uh, They Remain, which uh, was based on your story Thirty. And you actually made a you made a post. I'm going to read it. You made a post recently on Facebook where you said I consider Thirty primarily a horror story with weird elements. They Remain is faithful to the source material. I think the disconnect or confusion regarding its categor categorization is that a lot of people narrowly define horror. The genre is broad spectrum. So I wanted to know, you know, because it is interesting because I've seen They Remain. I got an opportunity to see it here in Los Angeles um, this past weekend. And it is, a, it is to your point, it is very um, uh, dedicated to the source material. And even if the source material is horror, the way that Philip Jalot made the film, it almost it almost takes it a different direction. It almost makes it even though the even though the um, the primary plot points are the same, I got a very different vibe from the film than I did from reading the story. It's, no, me too. Uh, and I talked about this. I did an interview with the four hundred five uh, recently. I don't have it up, so I can't really quote from it. But we talked about you know what makes what I consider, you know, to be a, the qualities of a character, characteristics of a good film versus a great film, um, et cetera. And also, you know, what makes something horror, uh, because this is a pretty popular, you know, topic. And I do think that horror, I, I, I agree with Rich, because he, 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 like I said, he took it right out of my mouth. If everything's horror, nothing's horror. But I do think it's much broader than people think. A lot of people think it has to be, uh, you know, represented by slasher fiction, or it has to be supernatural, or whatever. And I, I, I don't know if I know the answer, but I don't necessarily agree with that sort of narrowing, narrow definition. I think it's much, I think it's broader. But I think the secret is, it's not so much that everything's horror, or that a lot more stuff is horror than you think. I think the more nuanced take on it is that there's a lot more horror in 
the horror elements in in uh, in your peanut butter essentially than you thought. Uh, and so Phil, you know, I, I think he he did something that was that was very remarkable. He he remained extremely faithful to the source material. It follows the story with a few changes, but they're the kind of changes that sort of have to be made for it to, to, to work on, on screen. Uh, but it's still 70, 80, maybe even 90% faithful to, to the source. But he also made some profound changes. And those changes aren't things that you can simply articulate by, oh, you know, the plot was changed. No, it's more like what aspects of the story, what imagery from the story, he because you can't keep all of it. That would have been a four hour movie. It's only it's only a 15,000 word story, but if you were to keep everything in, you would have, you know, if you filmed everything as the, as Keith and, and uh, Jessica, or in the story, the nameless couple, as they saw it, it would be, it would be a lot more film. I think Phil said something, He there's a two hour and 40 minute version of it that he cut down. So it was already almost a three hour movie when he originally filmed it. But, uh, so what he chose to leave out and what he chose to foreground, I think makes uh, makes it a different beast than the story in a lot of fundamental ways. Uh, I think it's more science fictional in some ways. Right. And the Keith is very similar to the character in the story. Uh, I think he's a. I think he's a little, a little. Uh, his edges aren't quite as rough. Uh, the uh, Jessica character is a fundamentally different character than than she was in the story, which I think was an interesting choice. I think uh, Henderson chose, you know, and I actually talked to her about it. I was really, I was really lucky to meet her at the premiere. Uh, I was really enthused about her performance, but there is no question that it's different than the scientist in the story who was much more overtly sexual, overtly sort of cruelly fl flirtatious. And, but that's also because, and I don't want to say too much because it'll give away the movie if you haven't read the story or, or seen the movie yet, but the plot is actually slightly different. There, there's some, there are some uh, ch changes to the plot, uh, and and so he, by necessity, since he changed the plot, kind of where the plot was going in the movie, or, or actually the motivation behind the couple's kind of antagonism toward each other, uh, he had to he had to basically cut some of that stuff out or change it, because uh, I don't know if it would have worked as well. I'm interested in a little bit about the process because this isn't something we get to hear uh, from start to finish, like. How did it work? Like, who approached you that they were interested in this story to make it a movie? And then, what was your involvement throughout? Um, or, or were you as surprised as anybody when you saw the premiere? No, no. Um, I was. Uh, I have. I have a team of agents, uh, lawyers, whatnot. That sometimes they let me know what's going on well in advance. Other times they just. I find out when they when they ask if if. It, like in this case, hey, uh, we've been working on this deal for a few months. Would you like to talk to the filmmaker? We're pretty close to you know to agreeing on the contract if you if you're ready. And and so I I think it'd been in. I'm not sure. You can't quote me on this, but my understanding is that Phil and and Gillette and and Will Battersby had been talking to my agents for months, and they'd gone back and forth. That's just very typical. You know, this stuff takes a long time, and in, in some cases. Uh, and then the next step was I, I spoke with Phil uh, on the phone for a couple hours, and we had a really good talk. You know, I looked him up, and I I was inclined to have some faith uh, in what he would be able to do or what he'd be willing to do based on his writing for uh, Europa Report, which is a really great uh, science fiction, you know, weird or horror film. Uh, yeah, it is. Definitely, he did a few years ago, or was, was involved with, and he did the writing, and that was really important to me. And so we we talked, and i I only had a I only had a couple of um, requests because here's the thing: over the years, I I've had a lot of interest in my material. This is the first thing that's ever been made, but I've had other stories optioned, you know, on multiple occasions. Uh, I've also seen quite a few treatments, drafts, that kind of stuff. And one thing that I've been told, I had been told, and one thing that I learned is, with rare exceptions, just you take the money and you run. You don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you know, if, if you, either you don't do the deal because you love your baby so much and you don't want to see anything bad happen, because something probably bad is going to happen to your story. And judging from a lot of the scripts that I had seen over the years, it was 
you know, it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to look like a Larry Barron story at all on the screen. Uh, but this was different. And there are, and I, I hasten to say there are other people that I've, you know, worked with that if, if they had chosen or been able to bring it to, to the screen, that particular, those particular stories maybe uh, would have been really good. I mean, there was a potential, but in general, that's not the way to bet. Uh, they're going to do their own thing with it. So in this case, though, I was really lucky. It's a, it, it's, it's the good side of a very small film is that he had a Phil and, and Will had a lot of control over how it was going to be filmed and how it was going to look. Uh, I think the only bar was, was money. You know, that's the other side of it. If you don't have a lot of money, then you have to work very creatively to, 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 and, and cut a lot of stuff that you might've liked to keep. And uh, so we talked and I had, I had two uh, kind of conditions. And one was that the main one was that I wanted um, there to be no uh, battle between the two main characters like you see in most or, or many, many, many horror films where as the, you know, as things get bad, everybody screams at everybody, like it's sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, I didn't want that. I didn't want the children of the corn couple that just wants to rip each other's eyes out all the way through the book. I said, if we can avoid that, because the story, the story wasn't um, written that way. The antagonism, the antipathy, basically the homicidal mania was all except for brief out you know brief vents it was all the subterranean magma that was just bubbling and and you know is going to burst at some point as opposed to the screaming the, the, the screaming effect he said no problem and i've seen the film and he he kept his word and there are a couple well-earned outbursts in the in the show but it is a much different dynamic then I, I think that's one of the things that will please people that are so sort of used to that cliche of the of the couple or it could even be four or five people that sort of turn on each other and it's, it's a bunch of screaming and so none of that the second uh the second condition the only other one that i can recall having is that i said the lead has to be uh an african-american and he was he was on board with that and and my reasoning behind it, the way the reason that he even wrote uh as I'll just call him Keith, like I said, in the story, he doesn't have a name, uh, intentionally so. Uh, it had nothing to do with race being uh, a critical factor in the story. Uh, the, the scientist, the lead scientist race is not, uh, or even a lot of his background isn't all that important in and of itself, but it ties in with things that I want to do if and when I write a prequel to 30. I plan on writing about the scientist's father at some point. I actually have a novel sort of in outline for him. And I wanted that to be consistent. But also, uh, over the years, I've become more and more uh, sensitive to representation. You know, I see myself uh, on TV. I see myself, I see people who look like me in every form of entertainment. Uh, white, male, various income levels. But I see, I, I see, I see some version of myself. And I wrote 30 uh, because I felt like, you know, I don't. I don't do enough of it. There's no reason that this character can't be uh, African American, and or shouldn't be. Same reason I wrote uh, Mysterium and Tremendum. You know, you have four people in that story, two couples. The couples could have been heterosexual couples. The the fact that you have four gay men in the wilderness was had nothing to do with that being necessitated by the plot. But I'm just fucking tired of every time somebody tries to do something like this, well, what's, you know, why are they black or why are they gay or why did you pick women? I guess he Joshi going off on Vandermeer for having an all woman scientist team as if this needs to be just, if basically there has to be some fucking justification for, for people getting to see people who look like them in literature or on, t or on, or on film. And frankly, you know, uh, it, 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 it's it's a very trenchant point and it's it's such a it, it's such an easy thing for us to correct you know i look at my fiction i've written close to 70 stories uh i've written four novels now uh and a lot of my characters are and will continue to be white men white women heterosexual but i do i do enjoy challenging myself i do enjoy writing about people outside of my direct personal experience. And I think there are a lot of people out there that like, that there's, that there's no agenda. It doesn't have to be 
about something, it's just enough to even see some representation. And so Bill and I talked about that and he was, he had already, before we'd even spoken, he had already uh, drafted a list of actors that he, you know, was considering for the role. And that really, he could do no wrong after that, as far as I was concerned. Uh, and then he showed me the, you know, a few weeks later, I got the, sh the, the uh, draft uh, of the screenplay and it was, it was beautiful. You know, I couldn't even, and, and to this day, I, I have to check and see where his dialogue or his scenes are, are mine or, or different from my, or where mine ends and where, and where, and where his, his began. And, uh, and that was pretty much it. I was, ha I was very hands off. Um, I think I asked, I, went, I asked a couple questions. He emailed me a couple times, but it was pretty much, it was his show. Uh, it was his baby because that's, the, that's the deal. It's not my story anymore. My story is simply the jumping off point, whatever the movie turns out to be belongs to him and Will Battersby and the team, all, you know, Sean Kirby, all those guys out there and ladies out there that worked on this thing. Uh, and then, and then toward the end of filming, John Langan and I were invited to come up to the, the set in Salem. Uh, New York and we spent a day on the set and that was that was wonderful uh, and that was pretty much it you know after that I just would get an email every now and then um, telling me oh we're in mixing sound or we're or we're film edit you know we're editing uh, the dailies or whatever you know whatever we're doing uh, and that was that was you know months would go by and I wouldn't hear anything but that was pretty that was pretty much the level of my involvement um, I've got some questions from listeners who wrote ahead of time, uh, if we could get to at least a few of them. Uh, Mark Talon says, hi, Mike, can you please ask Laird if he still plans on writing the Michelle Mock from the Croning story? Oh, hey, Mark. Um, yes, I do, actually. It may be a novel. Uh, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's, it's on my list, along with a few other stories. All right. Chris Grassy says... I thoroughly enjoyed Laird's story, short story, Azathoth, in the anthology The Gods of H.P. Lovecraft, published by Journal Stone. My question, my question to Laird is, how did he come about developing the complex and twisted relationship between the brothers and their ruthless and uncompromising father depicted in the story? Um, so, right, the, in the anthology, that story, uh, is the first chapter of a novella that was published alongside the anthology. The, the entire novella is called X's for Eyes. And I basically what I did is I broke it in half. And so the first half appears in the anthology as um, we smoke the Northern Lights. Uh, some of it was experience. You know, I have a couple brothers. Uh, I, and I, also, I'm not, I'm pretty much estranged from my, from my parents. I never got along with my dad very well. Uh, but a lot of it was just um, things that I had read. Um, I, I took a little cue from Zelazny. I was, I'm a big fan of the Nine Princes of Amber series. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think you could see that, you know, in, in some of the, some of the Byzantine plotting and some of the, the idea that, you know, I think Z Zelazny or Corwin says something uh, early on in the series when he meets somebody new who seems kind of an ominous figure. And he says something to the effect of, I trusted him like a brother. Which was to say, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. And then you go to the next chapter, you're like, that told you, and he's already told you he has eight brothers and what was it, two or three sisters. You know? So that tells you right there, oh, this is pretty fucked up. And so, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a combo of my life, uh, you know, at least in the level of, of, of kind of like uh, dealing with my dad, but, but more so, you know, the great, the great Byzantine plots and Machiavellian plots from, uh, from the wide and rich, rich bibliography, you know, that we have out there to choose from. It wasn't, you know, there's, uh, I mean, I don't know. It's kind, of, it's kind of similar to like, you know, when somebody asks you, you know, where do you get your ideas from? Uh, a lot of times I dream some, I have a terrible dream and I wake up and I, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a portrait or a, a landscape or something. And I just try to create a, I try to create a narrative uh, based on that. And that's kind of what happened here. I created at least for the at least for the relationship uh, stuff. It, it was based on a portrait of how I felt about my dad, my brothers, which I'm actually quite fond of my brothers, and uh, you know, in, uh, influenced by my betters in the science fiction and fantasy community, I guess. Corwin says later on in the series uh, something to the effect of "There are there are none of you good doctors 
psychiatrist who could handle any of my family anyway. Something to that effect. Right. Hey, Mike, um, I got to take off. I'll, I'll see you guys next right. week. Hey, Thanks Peter. for being here, Pete. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Matt Bartlett says, if it's not a sensitive topic, uh, whatever happened to the release of All the Devils Are Here? Well, hey, hey Matt. Um, it's not a sensitive topic. Uh, business relationships are evol constantly evolving. Uh, I'm not working with Journal Stone. Uh, so X is for Eyes uh, and the, Na the Nanashi novella, uh, Man With No Name, were with Journal Stone. And there was some talk about doing uh, doing a series, but for various reasons, that's not going to happen. However, um, it will happen with someone at some point. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm very much invested in writing more uh, about the Tombs Brothers from Exes for Eyes and definitely writing some more material in the, in the Nanashi uh, uh, setting or series, I should say. Uh, Michael DeBronzo says, how would he feel about his work being adapted into something like a graphic novel? Uh, the man from Porlock, Hand of Glory, Blackwood's Baby, Exes for Eyes come to mind. Absolutely. Actually, um, Exes for Eyes and The Light is the Darkness, I didn't, in, it, it wasn't my intent, you know, to slant them in this way, but the effect or the result certainly has, has struck me as something that would translate pretty well to uh, the graphic novel uh, medium. And I, I would love it. Uh, my only misgiving, and this is you no know, offense to any, any comic or graphic novel people or comic people out there, is just that I don't know a lot about the field. And what little I do know is that it's hard to keep your rights. Um, so in other words, I would really be interested in you know, not giving up the rights to the characters. Generally speaking, you know, in other words, the Coleridge novels, those novels basically essentially per contract belong to the publisher forever. That's just how it, that's how it works with the big publishers. But the character is still mine. Um, you know, if I stop writing, if for whatever reason, my publisher doesn't want to do more Coleridge novels, there's nothing stopping me from uh, selling Coleridge novels elsewhere or developing comic books or movies, you know, whatever. Comics, uh, from what I understand, this is what I what I have, my little bit of research, that can be perilous. Uh, you can lose the rights to your characters, uh, especially if you publish with the bigger, with, with the bigger, uh, the bigger houses. And so that is the one, I don't, I don't want to give up, you know, the rights to the Tombs Brothers just for the sake of having them on a graphic novel. But if, if we could work something out, if I could, if something like that, an opportunity like that presented itself and uh, we could get all the contract stuff taken care of, I would be, I would love it. I because I, I love graphic novels. I love comics. I grew up on that. I mean, I probably should talk about that more when I'm being you know, interviewed or when I'm doing essays because uh, they're a big part of how I learned how to tell stories. Well, I'm, I'm game for talking about comics all day long. So <laughs> I love them. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Didier says, what are some of Laird's favorite horror films? regardless of whether they are considered classic, recent, or even not classified as horror. Actually, I, I wrote a few down. Um, can you guys, I hope you guys can still see me. I just brought up my... Yeah. You know, I, okay, so I just, I made some notes just in case. Uh, cause actually, I saw a couple of the questions uh, earlier before the show started, so I happened okay, to good. see... I, so I didn't see all of them, but I saw something about booze and, and uh, books and then this. So yeah, me, I want to get to that MacGuffin question. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, so let me just read, uh, and, and this is not comprehensive. Uh, and if I were to make a list of my favorite movie, you know, horror movies, it would be different tomorrow, most likely. And, 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 and I will also say I've left off some of the most obvious, like Aliens on here. But I mean, there's a lot of obvious ones. But I will say this, uh, The Thing by John Carpenter, John Carpenter's version of it, is hands down my favorite uh, horror movie. And one of the reasons that I'm so staunch a supporter of that film is that it also is a wonderful movie outside of its genre. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, a movie is, well, it's a great example of its type. Now, I think The Thing is actually a great example of a movie. Uh, that said, Sauna, which came out a few years ago, I, I believe, the original uh, 
title of it is The Filth. That's a, that's a wonderful movie. Um, Session 9, uh, Gozu, which is by Takashi Mika. Another one. Actually, there's three by, by, by Mika. I've got Gozu, Itchy the Killer, and Audition. Uh, it's sort of like an unholy trinity from him that I that I, I, I rewatch on occasion. Cure by uh, Kurosawa, uh, the other Kurosawa. Europa Report, uh, what we talked about earlier. And then a couple that fit into, I think fit into the you know, Rich's idea, are these really horror, are these really horror movies? Uh, and, but that was part of the question is even if it's not widely considered a horror movie, you know, would you, maybe something that's on the fringe. And I think uh, Refn's Only God Forgives and Valhalla Rising are, uh, if not horror, not uh, horror movies are um, extraordinarily inflected by, by horror. Uh same same guy Daniel Didier he says in a in a related vein what novels Laird thinks requires special mention and readers of weird fiction and horror could appreciate even oh. if they are not explicitly weird or horror absolutely um, and some of these I actually think in some cases may be you know equally weird fiction but uh, the, these are kind of edge cases. Once again, these are uh, in a couple a couple cases are very much edge. Uh, Child of God by McCarthy. That kind of you know is up there, uh, and maybe you know it's right up there is one of my very favorites that he's done. Maybe anybody. Uh, Coco by Peter Schraub, which I think in some ways has to stand near the top of the you know as a seminal uh, serial killer novel. I think it really. Uh, is sort of almost archetypal in some ways. Uh, to the White Sea by uh, Dickey. I don't know if too many people here are familiar with that one. It's basically uh, a guy uh, during the, the war. Uh, he ends up he ends up trapped uh, in in Japan, and it's a it's basically it's like Deliverance. It's very much. It came out you know years later to mixed reviews, but he sort of is 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 uh, sneaking his way across Japan trying to get to the, you know, the white seas of the, of the title. And it's, it's, it's not, it's definitely not a horror or weird novel, but it can, its concerns are so esoteric in places and so primordial and so horrific that I, I find that I dream about it sometimes. That's a, like I said, it was, it received mixed reviews, but I, I think it's a classic. And I think it was Nick Pizzolatto who turned me on to that. I, I I apologize if it was somebody else, but I'm almost positive. Uh, back in the days when he and I were pen pals, um, I believe that was one of his uh, suggestions, and, and it was a damn good one. Engines of Desire, uh, Tales of Love and Other Horrors by Livia Llewellyn. Uh, no question that this is a horror slash, not slash, uh, weird fiction collection uh, that I would recommend to everyone, but it's going to punch you right in the mouth. Uh, and, and a slightly softer but no less affecting collection uh, by V.H. Leslie. Uh, it's called Skine and Bone. It's a collection of stories. And I reviewed this one uh, for Locus a couple of years back. And I'll just read you a quick, you know, it's a, it's a long review, but I'll just kind of read you toward the, what I wrote toward the end. But it, I said, Leslie imposes her will through menace and dread more so than depictions of direct violence. This is horror that fulfills a literary equivalent to sipping black tea and brandy, not the thunderclap of a shot of raw whiskey through gritted teeth. Skine and bone gets one coming and going, but mostly going. These stories linger in the mind like ripples in a night pond long after the flung stone sinks into darkness. And well, uh, last thing I'll leave you with about that is uh, her stories are very difficult to categorize, except in broad terms. But she really reminded me, uh, some of her conceits and some of the, the after images are uh, very rem redolent of uh, Shirley Jackson, for example. There's a sense of paranoia in some of her stories. Uh, even, and she writes, some of these stories are Gothic or Victorian, you know, ghost stories or revenge stories. Uh, so there's like some Angela Carter in there too. And she's wholly her own thing. But I just I noticed that some in some of the relationship stories, Shirley Jackson's influence, whether whether that's 
the case or not, but to me, uh, the Shirley Jackson influence seemed pretty powerful and well done. There are a couple of various questions about the theatrical release of They Remain, and also in addition to that, will it be on DVD and or digital release like Amazon, Hulu, Netflix, that sort of thing? I can't speak for any of that stuff with authority because I'm not um, I'm not involved with it. But right. it is my understanding that it's going to have limited theatrical release for the next you know month or so and then at some point this spring uh it's going to it's going to go to dvd for sure uh and because i actually was involved um with recording uh this commentary so i so i know that's going to happen uh oh, there's gonna be a dvd commentary that's great oh, yes yes i don't think we talked about the movie though but anyway um <laughs> was Latin and i drinking and we were chatting while the movie was playing um but you know for those who are interested <laughs> Uh, there it is, but but that does answer that part of the question. It's going to be on DVD, I believe Blu-ray is what it's going to be on, um, and I don't know the particulars, but I'm given to understand that there's going to be a pretty a, a broad uh, digital, like a robust digital presence at some point. I don't know specifically though okay. what that means. I just know it's it's going to appear somewhere, and probably more than one where. Kevin Wilson wants to know how Athena is doing. Your dog. Athena, let's see here. She's passed out on the floor next to me. Um, I appreciate that question, by the way. Uh, last year was a pretty tough year. Athena, you know, everybody loves their dog, and so I'm, you know, I'm nothing special in that regard. But Athena, and, and, I, and I guess it's probably a cliche to say, you know, your dog is more than a dog for some of us. But Athena really is more. And man, it's been. Been a tough year but she's okay uh she basically not to be morbid but she has one paw in the grave i mean it's we're we're, we're on borrowed time but uh yeah how old is athena uh she's she'll if she makes it she'll be 16 here uh, this fall so wow. she's 15 and a half now and you know i i thought that she had seen her last days uh last may so you know very much praise the the veterinarian team that essentially saved her um you know but it 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 was it had a cascade effect you know i uh wanted to hand the novel in in october and i wasn't able to hand it in until it was all worked out you know they were very flexible about that they were really nice and gave me more time but i lost one solid month you know lying on the floor with her just around the clock i didn't do anything but take care of her yeah and then she just, it, she didn't really recover for, a, at all, for, or at least not in any meaningful way for a long time after that. And, but she's had a good, you know, the last seven months or so, she's had a, as much as she can at this age, she's had a great, it, it was worth it. I, I feel like I gave her, she's had almost an, another year of uh, at least 10 months of quality life. I mean, she's, she's happy. She wants to be here. It's just that, you know, she, you know, I, I remember her as a puppy, and you know now she's. Oh God, yeah, I, I know what you mean. This is not about me, but I just want to say that I, I know how you feel in regard to this, and it's hard. It's very hard. You know. So. Yeah, I. Uh, I'm pretty tough, but not about Athena. Yeah, I understand. Believe me. Uh, well, moving on to something fun, you, I, I got to ask you this dumb question, sort of like a who would win question, all right. Batman v Superman, all that, all that crap. So Matthew Scudder, which is Lawrence Block, uh, Jack Reacher, Spencer, uh, F. Paul Wilson's repairman, Jack, Travis McGee, uh, Charlie Parker. I think you said you haven't read much of those yet. No, I don't know much about it. Who, who's the who's the toughest detective of all these of the ones that you've read? Who who would kick the other guy's ass? <laughs> I, I think it would. I think it would end up being a draw. Isn't that kind of how it? I think they would cancel. <laughs> each, and not, I'm not trying to cop out. I just think they would cancel each other out. I don't think any of them. I mean, obviously Jack Reacher is probably a yeah bad group, off the top of my head. He's written to be the badass, but you know, the thing about detective fiction is at least the the hard boiled version, not the naturalistic kind of, you know, uh, uh, 
down on you know downtrodden detective fiction uh where being kicked is kind of a virtue uh but i think all these guys are heroes of their own story so uh i think basically what would happen is you would just have a comedy of errors and everybody would end up drinking at a bar together i because I've, I've actually thought about doing Probably. that probably with all my tough guy characters, because I've written a lot of, I've experimented with, experimented with, and and worked on the tough guy archetype. You know, like I think I said earlier, you know, Isaiah Coleridge is sort of uh, my synthesis of of these various characters that I've worked on right. uh, over the years. I feel like I've perfected within my own capability to do so. I've sort of perfected what I've been working on at this point in my life, right, my writing career, that Isaiah Coleridge sort of is uh, the pinnacle of the tough guys that I've tried to, that I've tried to create. So, uh, but, but it had occurred to me, you know, cause I have quite a few uh, that I should do a story. Maybe John Langan tossed it to me or pitched it at me is I should do a story where they're all in a bar uh, going, you know, kind of over to you by Roald Dahl. Like, oh, remember that one? Did you ever do this when somebody wanted you to do that? So I think that would be be funny, but 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 ultimately, I don't. I think everybody would be sitting there, uh, putting ice packs to their noses and eye, eyes, and going, "Wow, that was that was ugly." Let's just drink. Yeah, I think and you're right. Silver sewers and silver men and and other uh, significant others should probably come in and ask, you know, basically ask them why they're being such uh, such. <laughs> so well, there, was, there, was, there was a comic years ago. Uh, I think it was Marvel Two in One that featured the thing. And he walks into a Yancey Street bar, and the Sandman's sitting there with a pitcher of beer. And for a couple of panels, you figure, oh, here we go, we're going to get into it. And the whole comic is them sitting there drinking a couple pitchers of beer, talking about where they started, how they got where they were, why they were this, why they were that. Um, and... And in some ways, it was very radical that it's not a fist thrown. Um, and you really get a lot of character examination. Um, that would be fun. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I never, I, I don't remember that one, but it makes sense. And Zelazny kind of, he, he did stuff like that. The You know, the antagonist would sit down and have a chat. You know, if somebody's going to die, we might as well have a smoke and, you know kind of prepare ourselves buffy the vampire slayer there was an uh i remember there was an episode where she was out patrolling and uh when the vampire it was just a generic vampire and he burst out of the ground and they went to attack each other she went oh my god we were in senior class together That's and the right. whole ep it was it was really touching the whole episode they they talked and it was really poignant I, you know joss whedon though he gets I, actually i don't know if it was him but that show the team the writers uh the production crew or the production, you know, staff, they really got the poignancy sometimes. And I think that was a pretty powerful, that's a powerful thing. Yeah, she killed him in the end, but uh, he right. helped her, he helped her see a different point of view. Right, right. It wasn't, uh, yeah, it, it, there was violence, but it was just, yeah. it was It was almost sad when it happened. You know, you, right. just, you actually felt, I felt something. Um, yeah. So it was I well mean, done. Hey, uh, well, you and I are big, and I know many other people are a big, big fans of the Spencer series, Robert, Robert Parker. Yep. Um, you said something very interesting to me uh, when we were talking yesterday about, you know, a story from Hawk's point of view. For those who don't know, Hawk is a friend of Spencer's and pretty much just as tough as Spencer is. Oh, right. Okay. Well, um, so, so back to blood standard and the question I get asked, you know, why Coleridge, what's going on there? Um, and there's a lot of, re you know, there's a lot of reasons why. Why is he half Maori? Why is he a ex hitman? You know, there's, there's so many choices you made. Why'd you make the ones that you made? The genesis for Coleridge, at least this, in the context of this, this character at this time and place, had a lot to do with um, two things. One was obviously what we talked about. Wouldn't it be interesting to get a novel or at least a novella from Hawk's point of view? You always get it from. You always get it from Spencer's, but you know Hawk is sort of this enigmatic figure. Um, and I haven't read all of the books, so there could be some. I'm sure there's something in there that maybe gives you a lot more character development. But generally speaking, you know, you just get drips and drabs about him, and and also from the commentary, as you pointed out, that he makes, uh, you get an idea of this guy, and I think it works very well. And I, I don't think that the the series would be enriched by 
having done a novel from his point of view. Uh, and I have no interest in writing, you know, uh, some kind of fan fiction, but it did. But the, 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 the nugget of that interested me, uh, as did when I watched Pulp Fiction, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character, the fact that at the end of that movie, he departs to points unknown to wander the earth and hopefully do good deeds. And you don't know whether that's going to work out and how it's going to look. And I said to myself, those are two really interesting ideas. So instead of just doing a typical Irish ex-cop or boxer or whatever, or even, or even just the, the basic thug idea, I wanted to do something that, that sort of played with those, not those characters by any means, but the idea behind them, the, that little, that, 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 that kind of inspiration, you know, of someone trying to, to go straight after basically compartmentalizing themselves for years, because not all, not all of these guys, the, uh, these, these, these contract killers or tough guys, it's not necessarily the case that all of them are animals born and raised. Uh, people, are there, there's a lot of nurture involved and, and nurture requires compartmentalization uh, doctors surgeons are some of the coldest people you'll ever meet because they can't look at a, a human being as a human being while they're working on them. they have to be a project they have there's a process and so i said to myself you know let's number one assume that this character is not a serial that he's not pathological uh, and is not uh, a maniac it's just someone who is able to compartmentalize in the way that uh, criminals have been known to do. I, I was reading, uh, I forget what the book was called, but basically it was by Dr. Hare, the guy that did the hair, the, the hair scale that uh, of psychopathy. There's 20 points on it. And according to him, and this has been years ago, but in the 90s, something like 2% of the prison population or less would be considered psychopathic or sociopathic. So even amongst the criminals, we're talking murderers and rapist and you know uh wife beaters the whole nine yards that's still a small uh percentage of people and part of that is because criminal psychopathy doesn't necessarily indicate that you're going to be a murderer there are lots of people who aren't crazy who murder who beat you know they have other problems but being a sociopath isn't one of them and so i looked at this and i said all right let's get rid of all of the cliches what, what can we do with a character who maybe has a p potential for for living a normal life uh, the next question is, would they be able to? Would they would they be able to? And then the third question is, would they be permitted to? And so that's what the, I so I took those two uh, points of inspiration, and then obviously you know did a lot of other stuff with it. But that's in a, in, a, in a nutshell, that's kind of my sort of creative mission statement is to sort of or or um, you know, I guess just mission in general is to explore those three points about this character. Um, you mentioned the 405 interview a while back, right? And I did read that interview, and I found it very interesting what you said about the ending of True Detective, yeah. because Pulver will disagree with you and I. But uh, wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure, but what what aspect of it are you interested in? The, well, the, the happy, the happy <laughs> ending. Oh. You know, I you said, said something about they should they should both both right. be underground with the lawnmower men, you know, mowing the grass above their grave as they scream six feet below or something to that effect. Right. Um, yeah, I don't I don't want to. I'm not arrogant enough to tell to, to think that I can tell another artist what they should or shouldn't do. But it was. But if you're going to ask me a direct question like what I would do differently, yeah, how it to me that I'm going to I'm going to leap in and. And so I'm not second guessing what they did. I'm just, as a viewer and also as a, as a writer, there are just things that would have been more satisfying in context of the series. And with, with the caveat that I've only watched four episodes from the series and then I've watched probably most of it just through chunks. So I, I haven't actually sat down and watched every episode end to end, but I, I know pretty much all there is to know about it. So with that in mind, I just felt like the, even though it was well done, I felt like the whole hospital scene was just sort of incongruous. I almost felt like, and I don't want to like, you know, try to basically, you know, 
predict or, or or speculate about stuff that I don't know. But so, but the point is, is it felt like it was by committee almost. It almost felt like other people came in and said, "No, you can't end it the way you want to end it." Because he's a lot of those are dark. He's many things, but the guy's a good writer, and he's dark. And I, I honestly think, I you know, if he were to if he were to cop to, oh no, that's how I wanted it, then I'd be like, "All right, we're all capable. We contain multitudes," as Whitman, Whitman said, you know, and and maybe a sappy ending. A semi-sappy ending is part one of his multitudes, but I honestly think that other people probably dabbled in that, and I felt it was tone just uh, you know there was this dissonance, this tonal dissonance uh, from the rest of the show, and what should have happened is it should have been a dark, you know, uh, unhappy ending, and and the one I tossed out was just the one that occurred to me, but basically. They should have lost. Uh, they should have been buried alive. And yes, the final scene with him sitting on the lawnmower, you know, he should have been, you know, smoothing over the grass over where he buried him. And I thought that would have been more satisfying in a lot of ways. But I could see where maybe a general audience uh, would disagree. Oh, it, it would have. And, and, it, and, and I didn't love the end of this. I just, at, the, at that particular time, it's like, Maybe yeah, I was someone's on the, the board. Someone's on the live comments going, "Yeah, what did Joe say?" <laughs> I, I just, I thought it was logical, expected that it would get dark at the end, and the fact that it didn't was, oh, okay, that's different. I, I like the fact that we didn't play it pat. Um, if it had been, if it was the right darkness. Yeah, that would have been infinitely better. Well, you actually – let's go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a thought there. Um, <laughs> but I, I didn't mind this because I thought, you know, we're, we're a train on a track. This ends at the end of this track, period. There's no other tracks. So we're, we're being forced to this ending. And – then he switched gears and it's like, Oh, okay. Um, another day, another mood, I would have been livid. So, well, but, but no, Mike, actually, Mike. well, to your point, I actually, I can see that my only quibble with, or actually not even a quibble. I would, I would have actually been fine with a, a reversal, but I still think the ending needed to be, more of a gut punch. So in other words, it's not that I thought that they need to die or lose, but there should have been a gut punch at the end. That's really what, what I think is the, the problem. Two things. One, the fight was boring. The showdown with the with the bad guy was extraordinarily about as about as boring as you get. There was no there was nothing really creative about that. It was very cliched how they how they uh, how they prevailed. Uh, but the ending needed to be a gut punch. So whether that was them losing or whether that was more to your point, a reversal of some kind. Everybody's kind of like, well, maybe, maybe you know, uh, character progression, you know, character arc. But there needed to be something at the end that made you. And I suppose that his idea or their idea was, oh, but the great evil hadn't truly been defeated. But that's that's every horror movie ever made is that the great evil is like, Alien Nine is coming. You know, we know we already know that. I think there needed to be some kind of personal, something that was very personal to the to those two guys. And I would have been happier. Rick, do you have a comment? And, and I, I, one, one last thing, and I'll shut up, is let's face it. We know what a king and yellow addict I was. <laughs> Here's, here this damn thing is. Was? I was. I cut it tons of slack. He was overall getting it right. Um, and I was thrilled that it's like I'm just sitting there with my mouth wide open. It's like, I couldn't believe somebody was doing this. Um, so. Unfortunately, it turned out they weren't, but yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I, I just want to, did, did you see the uh, true detective two Laird? Uh, I've only watched like big chunks of it uh, on YouTube just to see. Uh, it really does not. So I, I can't give it a fair, like the, the first one I've watched enough of it. I feel like I can be, fair Th this one it didn't look very well wrought but i don't know if that's the case or not well it is inferior but it does 
have a gut punch ending. So I just saying maybe he was reacting to the criticism. Yeah, it could be. What I, the thing is, I I've read his collection. I read Galveston, uh, his novel, and you know, and just from the writing throughout the the first season, and even the, what I could tell of the second season, it's you know the guy is uh, I can I can promise you he's a dark dark writer, uh, but he's not the only one making these shows. There's a there's a team, so uh, and he's definitely not at the top. I mean he he's the face, but there are people that will interject, uh, so to speak. Yeah, well, I, 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 it, it's my opinion, right or wrong, and I don't know anything about it, but there's always suits at the top, and they're the money. Yeah. So, you know, it's like you, you work your, your buns off to go a certain place, and somebody sees something or interprets something a certain way. No, that's not what we want. Well, so, if, if, if they remain had been – produced with a large budget by, you know, a large studio, there would have been an explosion or two in it. That's an a rescue and probably a rescue scene or an attempted rescue scene. So, you know, that's just that's just some of the stuff that I saw in that last episode really struck me as not necessarily his vision, but more of a, a corporate vision. And I could be totally wrong. You know, I it just it doesn't for, for whatever the case, it didn't fit with to me, reversal or not, which I which I do, I, I actually have some empathy or sympathy for that. I just didn't think that it matched the rest of the show, and it didn't match it in a in a good way. In other words, it, to me, a lot of like one of the things I like about Asian cinema or Asian horror is they have no problem going on ta off on tangents, doing ninety degree turns at the end, where you sit there and go, "Now I got to watch the whole damn movie again because I don't know what just happened." And a lot of times that really works, but when it doesn't, it in this case, I just didn't feel like it did. And that was, you know, I think reasonable people disagree because I know some people love the ending besides Joe. So I, you know, this is just what, what my take was. I, I, and I will wrap this up soon, but I see you comment on Facebook uh, occasionally about shows that you're watching. Yes. I think you said you watched uh, Altered Car Carbon, for example. Uh -huh. What have you been watching lately that you like and that you looked at and you thought, this is no good? Uh, so what, the way that I watch TV, because I'm I'm basically chained to this keyboard trying to get all this stuff done for the last several several years. I was right. like, oh, I'll work from home. I'll be able to do whatever I want. No, it's actually <laughs> no. Then you, your boss turns into an asshole because he's over. <laughs> <laughs> he's a big one. Uh, so what I do what I do is I allot myself because uh, I'm I sleep about four to five hours an evening on a typical evening. So I have about eighteen roughly 18 or 19 hours in a day. And so I allot too to uh, doing whatever I want uh, as far as I, I love video games and, and I watch uh, you know various shows, as cinema and whatnot. And so what I do in the evening is I'll sit down uh, about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and I'll watch an episode or two of whatever it is. I, I stick to one thing at a time. I don't, I don't jump around that much. Um, although I have lately tried to find trying to find the right thing. And also my girlfriend, Jessica, she works at the library. So she'll bring me, uh, we don't have, we don't have cable. We have, you know, I have, I have Netflix and stuff, but um, you know, I don't watch first run stuff when it first comes out. I generally, unless it's on Netflix as a premiere, I have to get it either months later or on DVD or whatever. So she'll, she'll bring me stuff that's not available on my various subscriptions. And so I have to watch it when it, when she brings it. And so Ray Donovan kind of preempted, I was looking at, uh, I was getting ready to watch the, the Jessica Jones series, which I really loved the first one. Uh, I watched the first episode of Britannia, which is on Amazon prime, very intriguing, but I'm not, but, I, but the first one I was on the, I was kind of on the, on the fence about whether I was going to enjoy it. Uh, but those got preempted by Ray Donovan, which I realized has been out since 2013. Uh, matter of fact, Ray Donovan, premiered about the time I was in the middle of writing my novel. And one of the reasons that I, 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 I've decided to look at it is because of the father, the fraught relationship between uh, Coleridge and his father, Mervyn. It's this terrible, terrible relationship. And of course, then I see that Ray Donovan's exploring that as well with a similar character, you know, Ray Donovan's a fixer. Uh, 
with mafia ties and all that. So like, there's a lot of parallels in there. And so I said, all right, I need to watch this show. I can't, you know, how close is it to my stuff or vice versa? Uh, but more so going forward, you know, what, what can I do going forward? And as it turns out, it's, they're quite different. Um, I, I gotta say, John Voigt must just love his yeah. part. Well, jo John Voigt is the show for me. And there's a couple other, I forget what his name is. Uh, somebody, I, I mean, I know it, but it's up my tongue. The brother uh, who has the, the trembling hand, the you know, owns the gym. Uh, he is a great, like my second favorite actor on the show. The guy is just tremendous. I'm about eight episodes in the first season. But yeah, John Voigt, whom as a human being, I could not be more diametrically opposed to. But just shutting that part of my brain down and watching him chew the scenery is it's a master class. The guy is a, is is conducting a master class in acting and he and it's a, it's a show of good actors. I mean Liv, Liv uh, uh, Schreiber is, is a wonderful actor. Uh, Avi and I'll, I'll blow his name too, but that was uh, that actor was Scar you know was Al Pacino's buddy in Scarface. Uh, so wonderful, you know wonderful character actor. Uh, the assistant Alina, wonderful. There's all these wonderful, juicy characters. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do with them. The show for me, the show, kind of like, it dips in and out of being great. In some places, the writing and the cinematography and just the general tone of the show, is on par with some of the, what I think is modern classics like the first season of True Detective, or The Wire, or um, Breaking Bad, where it's almost like. Your, it's motion picture quality in some ways. And other points, and this is in every episode so far, it's a TV show. And I don't mean that to disparage, but just that it's, it just drops out of being great and it's, 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 it's good. Uh, overall though, I'm, I'm pretty enthralled with it. Um, you know, it's implausible. I, 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 there's a lot of implausible. It's not as naturalistic as I was hoping it would be. It's definitely a fantasy. Uh, but I, you know, if you like crime, if you like, if this is your, if this is kind of the genre you like, I, there's nothing, there's no reason not to watch this, at least eight episodes in. And have you seen Bosch? Yes. Bosch, um, talk about apples and oranges, right? That's yeah. a naturalistic show. It contains, you know, Conley does, I mean, it's, it's realistic. Uh, and so it's a completely different kind of show. It's very buttoned down. Um, I watched the first season. And then I was partway through the second season and I just haven't gotten back to it because of various things. But I love, um, I love Lance Reddick. Um, I love the main, I love the, I love the gentleman playing Bosch. Uh, my only knock on that, it, it's a not, it's a knock on how Conley writes. It's just that there's never any humor. There's absolutely no, you know, occasionally something funny happens in, in all good crime fiction. There's, there's, there's dry humor, there's outright side splitting humor in it. Bosch occasionally will go for that, but the humor is always, for me, is always very forced. And it's so, it's so cop centric. Actually, I would say it's cop centric and give him a pass, but nobody can write better humor as far as naturalistically related to the police department than Joseph Wambaugh. Wambaugh is, is fucking hilarious. You will laugh one moment and sob the next or vice versa. So it can be done. Um, and, and, and Conley stuff doesn't, he's got all this, these other major talents, these great guns that he had, he can bring to bear, but humor isn't, isn't one of them. The, the closest thing that, that, that so far that I've laughed at, and it wasn't a joke, it was just a sardonic, as black as night, you know, bit of humor was a woman had committed suicide, beautiful woman, wealthy, looked like she was wealthy, sitting in a nice car. And so Bosch is going over the crime scene and this, and this, you know, young beak or uh, you know, uh, uh, uniform cop says something to the effect of, "She had it all. You know, she's beautiful, rich, all, and she blows your brains out." And Bosch looks around and goes, "Yeah, why would anybody blow their brains out on such a beautiful day?" You know, just this, you know, just kind of cut him down with that little. I would love to see more of that. We don't, yeah. we don't see that. But that's that's just me picking it. He, he is really that's a good series. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think like if you were looking at it as a novel, and you're looking at line sentence level that it's a much better sentence level series than than um gets higher quality and craft than ray donovan but but i love ray donovan because it's more than the sum of its parts it's a it's a rollicking good story and you go somewhere you you really do go somewhere else when you watch ray donovan it's definitely fantasy 
you know, uh, escapism in some ways. You mentioned video games. What video games do you like to play? Um, I'm a huge video game player. And like I said, now that I work, you know, like for the last 10 years working from home, I play them far less than I used to. Um, I like a variety. My two, my two major categories, though, are uh, RPGs, role-playing games, and that would be the Elder Scrolls series, so like uh, Morrowind, Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Where there's a there's a narrative element. You 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 travel around, you know, as a character, solving quests and whatnot. And there's a lot of interaction uh, and mysteries to solve. I, I really like the open world uh, aspect. The yeah. other yeah. the other category, and I, I guess there's many categories that I really enjoy, but uh, based on my mood usually. But the other category that I, you know have to put at the top is a uh, strategy i love i like strategy um computer games and that would be uh historical simulations like the total war series where you you have the helm of the roman empire and you, you build the empire uh the uni uh europa universalis series where you have you know basically uh renaissance era um late medieval early renaissance era europe and you you run it uh, like the invisible visible hand behind. So those are those are the two major categories. There's a lot of games uh, in those. I like civil. Uh, I think a lot of people probably out there played Civilization, Sid Meier Civilization. I really enjoy those. And to be honest, those are the games. Uh, and then the third category is action uh, RPGs like Diablo. And when I'm writing a novel, like I'm really intensely under a deadline, and I decide, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take some time and play a video game. I almost always play either the action RPGs or the historical simulations because neither one of them operate on a level of my brain that interferes with thinking about my uh, narrative flow or narrative structure. Where if I play an RPG, it's you know I'm shifting back and forth. You know I go into their story. Uh, yeah. In a way. Yeah. So, what you mean? Yeah, and and so like when I was you know. Uh, I'm trying to learn though to, to work with that. Like when I was writing uh, this last novel, I actually was reading a lot of uh, excerpts from John D. McDonald and uh, Elroy and guys like that, uh, just as sustenance, you know, just just as almost like encouragement. Because sometimes uh, you get in a rut writing and it's great to knock yourself out of it. But for, but video games doesn't it doesn't work that way for me. It's just it, it, inter, uh, it can inter, a story in a video game can interfere with my with my process in a way that a, that reading a novel or watching a show doesn't. I, I don't know why. I think there's some level of interaction uh, that's required uh, when you play a video game. But doing simulations or whatnot, it works at a lower level. I can almost just sort of I can be thinking about one thing and conquering you know conquering Greece uh, with another part of my mind at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions for Laird before we let him go? Uh, I was just going to ask uh, if Laird, I don't know if you know, um, you're, I know you were going to do a little, a little touring for the book. Do you know yet the dates and any of that information? No, uh, okay. not the dates <clears throat> and it's not finalized. All I can say is just watch my website you can get me at uh, my author site, which is uh, LairdBaronWordPress.com. And I'm under Laird Baron uh, at Facebook and Twitter. And I will announce this soon. But I, I can tell you that I'm going to be in Arizona and Texas and New York uh, starting uh, in June. And it'll probably be, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a small one, but I'll be at some of the major bookstores uh, in June, you know, th throughout June. But I, I will definitely... Um, make a big announcement about that. Uh, I hope they get you to Los Angeles. That would be nice. But we'll see. All right. Uh, Blood Standard is right now available for pre-order uh, in Kindle and print, uh, hardcover. It comes out on May the 29th. And I just want to emphasize for all of Laird's fans, everyone listening to this and, and or watching this, that it really helps if you pre-order a book. If you know you're going to buy it anyway, it, it helps if you pre-order it ahead of time. Um, what I've been told anyway, I mean, Larry, feel free to disagree with me. No, that's pre-orders are actually more important to them deciding whether to extend more, um, another offer than late sales. 
they make a lot of their decisions now. They're, they're starting to make them now. So if you want to buy it now is a really wonderful time to buy it. So I link to it on the Lovecraft Easy and message board. But uh, if, if you don't have access to that, just go to Amazon, type in Blood Standard Laird Baron, and it'll bring you right to it and click on the pre-order button for either Kindle or, or hardcover, whichever one you want. So, uh, so yeah, thanks for talking with us today, Laird. I really appreciate it. That was my pleasure. It's good to see you guys again. Good to see you guys, yeah, too. Absolutely great to see you again, Laird. Yep. Good to see Joe. This is your third Sunday in a row. I'm so happy about that. Three in a row. Yeah. See, brain surgery did not kill me. <laughs> it, tr it tried to, but... You're looking good, man. I'm just, I'm just glad to see you upright and... Yeah, it was uh, um, we among a us. A couple of real scary weeks, brother. Um, yeah, I, I heard. So, um, I'm breaking out. For your, thanks for your well wishes. Much appreciated. You know, well, I'm, uh, I'm breaking out, out the scotch now. Now that we're. Uh... <laughs> hey. Hey, you should have broke that out at the one, beginning. One of, one of these one of these days, we'll have a Necronomicon. And maybe I'll show up because I was a guest of honor, even though I didn't bother to show up for it. Um, and maybe next drink year. a little scotch. I hope so. Yeah, I'm hoping next sure. year. Yeah, me too, brother. Me too. I would love to get my arms around a whole bunch of people. Yeah. It's not funny. like Davis, of course. No, yeah, of course not. Staying right in the ass. Yeah. Well, thanks, but, everybody, yeah. for being here. Uh, big thanks to everyone who listens, and an extra big thanks to everyone who's a who's a patron and keeps me going. Uh, if you're interested in that, you get a lot of extra content. Just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon, and we got some great guests coming up later on in the year. A couple of weeks, we've got Ellen Datlow. A few weeks after that, we've got Adam Neville, uh, Paul Trembley, uh, Victor Lavelle is going to be on the show in August, I believe. So we got some great guests coming up. That's great. Yeah. That's wonderful names. Yeah, yeah, they they really are. I'm glad they 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 want to come and talk to us. All right, thanks for listening, everybody, and we will see you and talk to you next week.